Well, good morning. Uh, let me greet you once again to this first Sunday of the new year. Um, just excited to be in the house of the Lord and be with our friends. Happy birthday, Susan. And Freddie. Uh, and my wife. Um, this morning, we're going to be a little bit of a non-traditional service. But we want this one to be a little bit more of a participatory one as well. Um, as we were talking and planning uh, out our year, we thought at least the first Sunday of the year would be a great time for us to, in a sense, try and refocus us as a church. And, and not that it's bad to do things the same way every time, but just to do things in a way to where our hearts and our eyes and our minds are turned toward the Lord uh, in a way that that sets us on the right trajectory. So uh, we're going to be following a pattern that we've done sometimes in the past uh, where we will focus on prayer and the acronym of ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. And so um, in order to do that, uh, there won't be a traditional um, sermon, so to speak, uh, but we will be going through communion. And we will be going through those parts of our prayer. Um, and so uh, in order to do that, uh, there's going to be just a couple different times where we will be involved in doing that together. So uh, I want to get us started with the A in Acts. And the A stands for adoration. And of course, that really is where we get a chance to pray about and focus on the Lord for who he is and what he has done. We are, we are giving him the glory that he is due. We are adoring him. Um, and so in order to do that, I would like us, if you could stand with me, and we're going to do a little bit of a responsive reading through Psalm 145. Um, and you'll see up on the screen uh, some of the verses. Now the parts that are in yellow and italicized, those are the parts that all of us as a church can do. Uh, those of you who have a hard time distinguishing colors, which I know there might be a few out there, uh, just follow along with the crowd. Um, so, yeah, let's see if we get that pulled up. So we're going to start with uh, adoration and reading out of Psalm 145. And again, the parts in yellow, uh, let's do that together. Um, so it starts with, I will exalt you, my God and King. And praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell his children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will mediate, I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. The Lord is merciful and compassionate slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, you rule throughout all generations. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all who look to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hungry and thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. 
He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. The Lord protects all those who love him, but he destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord, and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. You may be seated. So what I would like us to do now is just to take a few minutes quietly, um, or joyfully out loud. It's all right, too. That's quite all right. But individually, what I would like us to do is just take some time to pray in adoration of our God. And this passage that we just read together can list some places where you can start. Talks about his acts, his wonderful deeds, his miracles, his goodness, his compassion, his kingdom that we have a hope for, his promises that he keeps, his provision and his presence. So let's just take some time and individually focus on adoring our God. And then I will close this in a minute. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus, thanking you for who you are and what you have done. We started this service singing a song saying what he has done. And as we reflect back on this last year, or even this last week, Lord, we would would be amiss if we did not see the wonderful things that you have done. If we cannot look back at our time and, and praise you for your goodness. God, we thank you for your, your marvelous acts, for the miracles that you have, you have done on our behalf the way that you've provided for us, 
the way that you have given us a family, a family of believers, the way that you have given us a mission. Thank you for your compassion toward us. Each and every one of us have fallen and failed, have sinned in, in so many ways. We are not deserving on our own to be in a relationship with you, but your compassion and your mercy through Jesus and what he did on the cross allows us to come before you. So God, we thank you for that. It is only your goodness that we appeal to. God, we thank you that you have established a kingdom that is eternal, that is forever, that, that we, because of our hope in Jesus, know that is certain, and we look forward to it. And we thank you that in it, so we will see you in all your majesty, in all your glory, for, for who you are. Certainly, our mind cannot fully comprehend the beauty and the glory and the majesty that is you, our God. And God, too, we thank you for the way that you keep your promises toward us, the way that you help us, the way that you guide us through your word and through your spirit, the way that you have taken us as individuals and as a church family uh, to be able to uh, serve you and lift your name up uh, throughout this community and throughout the world. And God, certainly we can look back and see how you have provided for us. That when we have been hungry and thirsty, that you have provided food. That you have done more, abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. And that is all because of your goodness, the way that you have opened up your generous hand toward us. And most of all, Father, I want to thank you for your presence. That even as we read that you are close to all who call upon you. And so God, we call upon you now that throughout this day and throughout this coming year, that not only would uh, we know and recognize and acknowledge that you are close to us, but that we would sense and feel that as well. God, too often we focus too much on how we feel about our relationship with you, but help us to know and focus on what is true, yet, God, we ask that you would allow our feelings to walk in alignment with that truth as well. And so, Lord, we love you not just because of what you've done for us, but because of who you are. Your goodness, your graciousness, your holiness, your, your majesty. And so we fix our eyes upon you. In the name of Jesus. Today, as we begin the first Sunday of a month, we come to the Lord's table, as we traditionally do, um, and we want to reflect on it. And before we do traditionally, uh, because this is Paul's pattern, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he meets with the church at Corinth, uh, that he calls for a time of reflection. Uh, it emphasizes the weightiness of the practice of communion, of the uh, what Christ wants to do in our life as a group of believers. He wants us to enter in uh, to the reality of what he has done, what he is doing, what he will do. Uh, he wants us to view our lives from that perspective. So we come to the Lord's table today, and we're going to precede it by a time of confession. So the Lord set the table in his life and death, and he invites all who have abandoned themselves and every other dead end to freedom and turn to him as their only hope to come and be reminded of God's goodness given to them through Christ by the Spirit. 
As such, it's a celebration of blessings received at the time of our faith in Christ and of blessings we continue to enjoy. And it is a call to more fully enter into the life that is now ours in Christ. And the fair at the table is pretty rich. He calls them to come and be reminded of the depth of God's love for them. The Godhead conspired to love sinners, the ungodly and unrighteous, the rebels. They all agreed with the Father's will. They agreed that the Father must not spare his own son, but freely give him up. They agreed that the Son must embrace the humiliation of the incarnation and the cross. They agreed that the Spirit would make new and empower. Each willingly embraced their part in the great drama of mercy and grace so that the Father might lavish his favor through the Spirit on all those who have been united with Christ by believing on him. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he calls them to come and be reminded of all that God's love in Christ accomplished for them. He calls them to come and be reminded of their freedom from condemnation. In his death, Christ bore our sin on the cross so that the just requirement for the punishment of our sins might be satisfied now and forever. Christ calls them to come and be reminded that he has made them his own. We are adopted into God's family and have a place of welcome, a place of belonging, a place of provision, a place of security now and forever. He calls them to come and be reminded of the genuine life they have been given. This is a life which is theirs through union with Christ by the Spirit. Those believing in him have been made new, are empowered by the Spirit of God. They have everything they need to flourish now and forever. Christ calls them to come and be reminded of their freedom from sin's dominating power. Sin's domination has been broken. Satan and his schemes can be recognized and resisted. And Christ will soon come to complete what he has begun in them so that nothing within them or outside of them can tempt them to step aside from God's path of love and blessing. It is against this backdrop that we can come to this table and embrace repentance as a way of life. You know, as an aside from what I've written here, one of the things that uh, uh, is uh, continually uh, astounding is that people will do almost anything to avoid repenting and owning their sin. They will blame everyone else. They will blame systems and circumstances. Uh, the only way for freedom, right, is to accept the responsibility for who you are and what you have done and come to Christ for clean, cleansing. So when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, this is Martin Luther's statement from his famous 95 Theses, he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. We can come and examine ourselves today because we are accepted. The call to examine ourselves comes from the God who has freely given us all things by Christ through the Spirit and the God who has promised that he will complete all that he's begun in us when Christ returns. We do not come... This is important. We do not come to secure a place with him. We come out of our desire to please and honor him. Amen. We come out of our trust in him and out of a recognition of our vulnerability to sin and our utter dependence on him. We affirm that he alone provides our deepest needs and that he alone possesses the wisdom to guide us. Wow. Repentance is God-centered. Recognizing that sin displeases and dishonors him. It is not self-centered as if some act whereby we avoid sin's consequences or we earn a right standing with God by some kind of self-flagellation that convinces God of our sincerity and merit. Having experienced the love of God in Christ and standing secure in what he has freely done for us, we draw near and enter into this wonderful dynamic of grace. We, by faith, look into the face of Christ crucified one of the most compelling images for me is out of the Gospel of Luke, where after Peter denies Jesus three times, he looks into the face of Jesus. And it breaks his heart. And the communion is a call for us to look into the face of Jesus. Look into the face of Christ crucified and risen for us and let his loving gaze soften our sin-hardened hearts open our sin-blinded eyes, and clear up our sin-confused minds. 
And as he works by his spirit to allow us to see our own sin for what it is, the more precious, wonderful, and electrifying is God's grace. The more we are aware of God's grace, the more we trust him and yield to him, and the more we're able to drop our denials and self-defenses and admit our sin. The more we can cut the rope on the shame, guilt, disgrace, frustration, and hopelessness that keep dragging behind us and enter into a place of acceptance, hope, renewal, and grateful, joyful, and effective service to him. So I want to call us to a time as David does in Psalm 139 and this is a famous verse but it's uh, a call for the people of God uh, to make a part of their journey with him this side of heaven and this is what David prays in Psalm 139 search me God know my heart test me and know my concerns see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way so I'm going to give us an opportunity as, as people of God to pause. And let me, let me just encourage you, if you need to open your Bibles to Psalm 139, uh, you're directly inviting God to clean house. And it's the loving gaze of God. Pastor Van was talking about this before. What do you anticipate that God, when he looks in on your heart, as a matter of fact, he sees it completely whether or not you invite him to or not. What you're just doing is recognizing that he sees you to the core of who you are. So he knows your fears. He knows the things that are depressing you. He knows your, your inward struggles and disappointments. He knows your fears, your anxieties. He knows those things. And he's inviting you to ask him to come in, to speak to you of them, and for you to recognize the areas in which you're turning away from his goodness and grace, to confess that, to turn to him for repentance and acknowledge that he loves you despite who you are. And his love is expressed in calling you away from the things that are killing you. So I just want to encourage you as we pray for a moment, uh, just to ask God to invite him to search your heart, to see if there's things in you that are inhibiting your walk with him uh, and draw near to him in this moment, confess those, clean those up. And then we're going to come and sing uh, about gratitude and thanksgiving for the fact that God is a God of mercy and grace and forgiveness. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, as we bow before you together as your people, Lord, we acknowledge, uh, Lord, that apart from what you have done for us, we would have no hope. Apart from your grace and mercy, there would be no way forward. There's no way for us to deliver ourselves from our own uh, sin and rebellion. There's no way to bring peace into our lives and joy. There's no way that we on our own, Lord, can fix the brokenness, uh, Lord, that attends all of our ways. Lord, only you can provide the forgiveness that we need. Only you can provide the transformation uh, that we long for. Only you can meet the deepest longings of our heart. And Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, as individuals and as people that this week, Lord, we left undone things that we should have done. Uh, Lord, that we did not take advantage uh, of your resources this week and uh, maybe we let the week go aside without consulting you, without inviting you into it, without being reminded of our vulnerability and our need of you. More, even more uh, sadly, we acknowledge, Lord, that at times, even though we knew your will, we went wanted our own will instead. And Lord, we struggle with lust and greed, selfishness, pride, but letting our appetites control us instead of letting you control our appetites. 
Lord, we are a weak people in great need of you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that as we come to you today, that we come not to secure a place with you, not to somehow win your favor, but we come because you have given your favor to us despite our brokenness and have made us your own and you call us your sons and daughters and you long for us, Lord, to walk in the path of your loves for our blessing, for our peace, for our joy. Lord, you want us, Lord, to know uh, the life that you have given us to its fullest. Lord, you came that we might have life and have it to the full. And so, Lord, we pray, grow our trust in you. Lord, help us to understand grace more and enjoy it more so that we can live into it and lavish it on each other. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you're a God of forgiveness and grace. Thank you, God, of the second chance and the third and the fourth and the fifth. Thank you, Lord, that you don't hold our sins against us. Lord, you don't want us to live in regret. And so, Lord, thank you, Lord, for all you've given us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Father, may our words uh, be genuine, authentic, not hollow and empty. As we continue to uh, look to you in prayer this morning. Father, we ask for your strength and your help. Help us to pray. Help us to recognize that, Father, you have invited us and equipped us to be on mission for you. And the weights of this world and the entanglement of sin, Father, we, we do confess and recognize that it gets us off mission so easily. Father, we're your people. Identified with Christ. His death and resurrection. As we pause in this moment and pray. Father, you've given many of us the faith to believe that you are listening. We have an audience with you in your throne room. And yet so often we don't live as children of the king. We don't live as those who, who have been given the words of life and received and believed. And Oh, Father, uh, use us. Shape us, transform us more and more into the image of Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Uh, in your programs, there's a handout, and we're going to spend a, a few minutes uh, making some continued prayer, looking forward. It's a half page, and uh, the one side that's filled with lots of words we want to look at first. Then we'll look at the uh, circles later <laughs> in just a moment. But the page with lots of words is uh, taken directly from our church covenant and those who are uh, members of this church. This is a, a document that we often uh, use around here to, to remind us of some of the uh, basic, fundamental uh, characteristics, behaviors, attitudes that should mark God's people. And they're uh, listed here on this page. And uh, what I would like us to do, and uh, it'll be a moment of a little bit of, of disruption, but we can do it because uh, our seats move a little bit. And so uh, what I'd like us to do just a moment is uh, get into uh, groups of four or five or six and turn your chair around if you need to or to slide over a different part of the across the aisle or whatever you need to do 
and uh, make sure everybody in your group knows each other's names. And then I would just like to invite you to put the names of either your own name or the name of someone else in your group and say, God, I pray that your spirit would give Josh the strength to walk in Christian love. And I pray that you would help Stephanie to have a heart to watch over others in brotherly love. And I pray that Timothy would abstain from behavior that would hurt or harm the reputation of Christ. And uh, you don't need to go in any order, and if some in the circle aren't comfortable praying out loud, that's fine, but these are just listed right out for us of some things that we want to mark us as God's people uh, this next year, taken right from our church covenant. So why don't you go ahead and uh, move, turn, groups of four or five is fine, and then make sure everyone knows everyone's name, and then begin praying, praying by name uh, through this list, and then I'm going to close this time in about five minutes.
our Father. Uh, sometimes we are, are just uh, quick to, to pray for uh, mercy through difficult things. And Father, our, our words sometimes are just give us a good day. But Father, these are the things. These are the things that allow us as your church to live differently before this world. Father, these are characteristics that, that are sustained, created, uh, born of your spirit and sustained by your spirit. And we want them to mark us because we're your people. So thank you. Thank you for the joy it is to, to hear prayers being raised up to you on behalf of one another. Might, might that be something that, that becomes more and more of a pattern in our lives, God. Amen. Uh, flip the page over, please. Uh, here's a Here's the thing that I just want to give you uh, as, as a tool to use in your own prayer life and journal, and we won't have time to, to work through all of it. We are going to let you begin praying through this. But uh, it's to think about geographically where God has put you. And uh, you can start there in your neighborhood, but if you're a student, God's put you a classroom with certain classmates. If you have a locker, God's given you neighbors. If you're in a sports team, God's given you teammates. If you have a job, God's put you in a place geographically where you're interacting with certain people. Might God Help us to see that that's a place where God has called us to be on mission. We don't have to go to Egypt. We don't have to go serve bridges. But it's that place where you are. And, and on this list, it, it starts there near the center with your neighborhood. And maybe some of you don't regularly pray for those that live next door and across the street and around the corner. Maybe your prayer is that you get to know those people and make that a priority because that's an address that God's given to you. Those people that live on that floor of that apartment with you, whatever that is, right? Then our community, the schools and the services that are happening in our community and the needs of our community and the leaders in our community in our state, I don't know if it's a regular part of your prayer life to pray for your representatives and senators, our governor, our judges. Just need to pray, right? And then our country, and then our world. And this morning we're here in a comfortable, safe place, but there are many believers around the world that are uh, <laughs> it'd just be longing to worship with other brothers and sisters like this because they're alone, facing persecution, war, famine. There's churches right now that are overwhelmed by refugees and the needs that people have, the physical needs. And so, uh, the last few minutes here, would you just in your group, uh, Maybe you want to start near the center or maybe you don't even get past your neighborhood, but uh, pick a ring and pray and then I'll close this time.
Thank you, Father. To you, we uh, acknowledge our lives belong to you. So that as we move out into this new week, to this new year, uh, Father, it's all for your glory. Let all glory and praise and honor be to you. You alone are worthy. And as soon as we leave this place, there will be bright lights and loud noises and there will be so many things that seem so good. And we've sung today over and over again that Christ, you're enough alone. So help us as your people to trust in you and you alone. And as we do that together as a church, help us to help each other to trust in you and you alone. In Christ's name.